I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress, and your host for BC's Fossil Bounty. Join in the exploration of the fascinating science of paleontology, that lens that examines ancient animals, plants, and ecosystems, from wee single-cell organisms to big and mighty dinosaurs. Hi, I'm Dr. Kendra Kritz. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of British Columbia. And I'm the director of fossils at the BD Biodiversity Museum at UBC. And this is BC's Fossil Bounty. Dr. Kendra Kritz, paleoecologist, paleontologist, and geochemist. Her work has brought her to the arid deserts of Eastern Africa, to the birthplace of humankind. Closer to home, she looks to our fossil mammals whose teeth act like time capsules to record their lived experience of our world. So a lot of Young people get interested in science and paleontology by going to museums and looking at fossils on display and seeing T-Rex or all kinds of other charismatic fossils and animals that lived in the past. And I didn't quite have that same experience. I grew up in Oregon. I looked around at the beautiful Pacific Northwest environment that I lived in, and I was curious about the way that the world worked. And I asked a lot of questions because I was a very curious kid. My father, who's an electrical engineer, could explain pretty much everything to me. He could explain how a television worked. He could explain how a computer worked. But when I asked him about the natural world, he didn't really have an answer. And that little piece kind of stuck in my brain as this mystery or this concept that was so complex that it was even difficult for my electrical engineering father to understand. I wanted to understand all of the different components of ecosystems from the trees, the plants, animals, everything within it. And it always really fascinated me how all of these different parts of an ecosystem went together and operated together. Then I learned that the Earth also had a past, and that sort of grabbed my attention. Around the age of eight or nine, I thought, well, maybe I'll be an archeologist. Maybe I'll explore the past and try to figure out more about that. So I used to go in the backyard and dig holes, hoping to find things. I never did. Then my interest sort of shifted and I went back into biology and decided that I really wanted to be an ecologist. I wanted to understand the world. I wanted to study it and explain it and, and went to at University of Portland in Portland, Oregon to study biology. I spoke with my professors. I asked them about what it takes to have their job and they said, well, if you want to be a scientist, if this is what you want to do, you need to get some experience with research. And I was really keen to do that. So I started applying for research opportunities all around the world. The one that really grabbed my attention was this really unusual research post in Ireland, at the National Museum of Ireland, looking at the paleoecology of a giant elk that lived 12,000 years ago on the island of Ireland. And it used this technique that really grabbed my attention, stable isotope analysis. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know anything about chemistry, but I thought, well, this seems interesting. I'm very curious. I might as well apply. And I got the research position. So I flew to Ireland that summer and I found myself in the Natural History Museum there and I was surrounded. I was in a room of Irish elk, Megaloceros gigantis as it's called. This is a great ice age deer. It had an antler span of up to three and a half meters, so just absolutely giant. My mentors there said, well, 
you are going to essentially drill the teeth of these animals and analyze the chemistry of these teeth and tell us what they ate and tell us what their life was like when they were alive. And that just really blew my mind that we basically had this method that sort of operates almost like a time machine that lets us get this glimpse into the past of how organisms lived. I just truly fell in love with the Earth's past and I, I truly really wanted to know more and I really wanted to explore it in greater detail. And I particularly got interested in this kind of method, this geochemistry or stable isotope analysis. And basically what this means is that we can look at teeth, we can look at the chemistry of teeth, we can also look at other biological tissues where they're preserved, things like bone, hair, pretty much all of our tissues are a recorder of the chemistry of our environment, what we've been eating, where we've been living, where we go, where we travel to, our environment, climate. And that was what I wanted to spend essentially the rest of my career working on. I wanted to reconstruct the past. I wanted to understand the past. And my future advisor calls me on my phone and says, what are you doing this summer? He said, you know, we have this opportunity. We're going to Kenya. Do you want to come? And I said, yes, absolutely. And I graduated from undergrad. And five days later, I was on a plane and we flew up to the Turkana Basin in Northern Kenya. The Turkana Basin is a remarkable fossil locality. It records an almost continuous sequence of four million years of human evolution. It's this beautiful desert environment with a huge lake, Lake Turkana. It's one of the largest desert lakes in the world. And the goal of this trip was to explore the geology of this area and to look for fossil sites. So we spent about 10 days walking around the Turkana Basin, looking at fossils, looking at geologic deposits. And it was there, actually on that trip, really, that I started to formulate what I wanted to do for my PhD and became very interested in trying to understand the connection between environment and humans and how far back that connection actually goes. And if there are ways that we can use this chemical method, stable isotope analysis, geochemistry, to explore that in greater detail, I realized that you couldn't actually separate out the pieces of the environment that were impacted by humans and that humans were also impacting. There was this really deep, intimate connection between the two of them. As I went forward in my academic career, I sort of focused into this concept of trying to understand the Anthropocene and what the Anthropocene is and how old the Anthropocene is and if there are clues from the fossil past that can tell us something about how the Anthropocene came to be how we got to this point and exactly how far back in time we need to go in order to understand that. It hasn't really been thoroughly defined yet. We are actually still working on defining when the Anthropocene started and the full extent of anthropogenic change on the planet. But there is a, a group of scientists that came together, the Anthropocene Working Group, that sought to actually define what the Anthropocene is as a geologic unit is really interesting because if it's a geologic unit, it's one that we're living in right now. And the year that the Anthropocene Working Group kind of landed on was the year 1950, which is not actually that long ago. But the reason they landed on 1950 was because that was the beginning of a period of time at which these large scale changes started to happen on the surface of the Earth. This period of time is called the Great Acceleration and we see massive accelerations in biodiversity loss, in pollution, in production of new materials, things like plastic and concrete, which we never used to have before then, growth, socioeconomic markers. So there's a lot of reasons why 1950 makes sense, but more research is actually showing that humans have been impacting the planet well before 1950. And this was what my research had been leading me into. In fact, a large study came out a few years ago that showed that there have been large scale transformations on the surface of the planet going as far back as the beginning of food production about 15,000 years ago. So we know that this big change from living 
in the world as hunter-gatherers in small groups to growing our own food, maintaining our own crops, keeping livestock. This was a pretty substantial change, a technological change that happened in human history. Once that occurred, we see that there's a lot of associated environmental changes that go along with that. We have evidence that humans may have overhunted large mammals, the end of the ice ages, leading to collapse of a lot of different giant mammals such as mammoths that existed on the planet. That potentially constitute a substantial anthropogenic impact that goes back maybe as far as 50,000 years ago. Some people argue that when we harnessed fire about a million years ago is our best evidence currently, that constitutes a pretty substantial change, a technological shift that may have led to the beginning of the Anthropocene. Other people, and this is something that I'm working on with my colleagues now, want to question whether or not the Anthropocene might have begun with the beginning of our lineage, the evolution of Homo erectus, the oldest member of our genus Homo, about 2.6 or 2.8 million years ago. Because when Homo erectus evolved, we also see the appearance of tools, evidence of hunting and butchery, and there's also at the same time a collapse of different kinds of carnivores in Africa. So this kind of interaction between Homo erectus and carnivores might have kicked off an anthropogenic change at this time. If that's the case, then that means that the Anthropocene is sort of baked into our species. It's baked into our lineage. But I also take it even further back than that. You see this diversity of mammals, including humans, on the planet today, but prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs, right about 65 to 64 million years ago, most mammals were small rodent-sized creatures living in burrows under the ground, kind of running underfoot of large dinosaurs, trying not to get trampled, eating insects, doing what they could to get by. And once the dinosaurs went extinct, there was this opportunity for mammals to evolve and diversify and really take over the world. And that's exactly what they did. And we don't know very much about what happened in that time period immediately following the extinction of the dinosaurs. And in particular, how the ecology of those mammals that survived that mass extinction event might have shaped what they would become or I have led to all of the diversity that we have today on planet Earth. So we can get that early glimpse of mammal evolution. While that's not exactly the Anthropocene, it's sort of these deep roots of what would eventually become us, what would eventually become the modern world, trying to get a picture of what makes us as mammals interesting and unique and how it is that we got from being little rodents living in burrows to these organisms that have harnessed crops and plants and have pretty much controlled most natural processes on the surface of the earth and have taken over the planet. So my view is really large and really long in terms of looking at fossil history in order to understand how we got to where we are today. Dr. Kritz's work has led her to Ireland to study the biochemistry of fossil teeth of the Irish elk, Megaloceros, that great Ice Age deer. Using biochemistry, stable carbon and oxygen isotope ratios to understand their paleoecology, what they ate, and what their environment was like. She also looks at the dentition of animals like oreodonts, an extinct superfamily of prehistoric, cud-chewing artiodactyls with short faces and fang-like canine teeth. The last of their number died out about four million years ago, but we know many of their descendants. They're part of the group of mammals that includes modern-day pigs, cows, deer, camels, pronghorns, giraffes, and hippos. Amongst their living descendants, oreodonts are most closely related to camels and llamas. So I've been talking a lot about teeth and what they can tell us and what's recorded in them. So it's helpful to look at some teeth. So here we have a little piece of a mandible, an oreodont, 
This is a fossil kind of hog-like creature that lived sometime between 35 million years ago and 5 million years ago. And you can see here we have this bit of the jaw, which used to be made out of bone, but is now sort of turned into rock or lithified. But what's pretty remarkable is the teeth here, these molars that you see, they're the same as the molars in the back of your mouth as well. This kind of stained brownish looking color is the enamel of this oreodont. And enamel is pretty remarkable as a material. It's extremely durable. Uh, it's very tough. It's 95% mineral, so it actually has very little organic material, which means that it doesn't really break down once it goes into the fossil record. It stays the same. So if you're lucky enough, your teeth will also enter the fossil record. At least that's something that I'm hoping for. In this oreodont teeth, we've got about three molars here, and Luckily, a bit of the jaw has been broken off, so you can see kind of on the inside of the enamel. You can see this cross-section of, of what would look like even your teeth. The next time you go to the dentist, take a look at the x-ray and see what it looks like inside. You can see where the pulp cavity used to be in here, which has all been replaced with rock. You can see down here we have the roots of the molar, but up top we have all of this enamel, which is still here. So if we were to drill a little bit of this enamel and digest it in an acid to break it down and release the carbon in this tooth enamel, and we could take that carbon and put it into a really fancy instrument uh, that I have in my lab, an isotope ratio mass spectrometer, it can tell us the different kinds of carbon that's in this tooth enamel. And all the carbon that's in this tooth enamel comes directly from your diet, so what you were eating while you were alive and this enamel was forming. So this oreodont here, even though it's long been dead, still has a record of its diet locked away in its teeth that we can still access. And we can do this for any organism that has some kind of preserved biological material. So in most of the world and in, in most time periods, that means tooth enamel because it's basically a stone, it's, it's highly mineralized. Some places we might get really lucky and get bone you might get soft tissue or hair, but enamel's really what we're going after. Anything with teeth, anything, any kind of fossil tooth, we can analyze and explore and reconstruct what that organism's life was like. So all teeth are different. Teeth have evolved over many hundreds of millions of years to serve different functions. So different organisms have different kinds of teeth depending on what their diet is and what their needs are. If you look at a rodent, and this is a little rodent skull here, there's some things that are quite similar to the oreodont that I just showed you. Here we've got the rodent's molars. If you were able to really get close and look at it, you could see that they have some similarities to our own molars. So they've got a kind of troughs and channels and, and grooves that help us really chew and grind up food. They've also got some other interesting teeth that we don't have. Up here in the front, these incisors, they're the same as our incisors in the front of our mouth, but in rodents, they grow forever. So they just continue growing, and as the rodent gnaws away on hard material, the incisors get sharper and pointier, and it helps them bite and gnaw and chew through things. So if you ever had a mouse problem in your house and you see those tiny little bite marks taken out of things, that's thanks to their ever-growing incisors. Just like everything else, this rodent's teeth, small as they may be, also record its diet. There's a little bit of differences in what part of that animal's life it's recording that depends on when the tooth formed. Basically, if you have a fossil assemblage with a lot of different kinds of organisms and lots of different bits and pieces of that ecosystem, we can look at the isotopes in the teeth of all of these organisms and try to get a nice picture of what that whole environment looked like. Let's look at something more familiar. Here's a cast of a human skull. It's got some kind of interesting additions to it. If we look at our own teeth, you can see a lot of similarities to the oreodont. Take a look here at these molars. You can see a number of similarities if you're looking at this human skull, as you can see sort of the fossil molars from the oreodont that you see here. You can see that 
we've got that same kind of broad molar structure, these broad surfaces that we can use to grind food of different kinds. Um, you've got these kinds of bumps up top that over time will get worn down that will also help us grind and chew our food really well. So a lot of mammals, especially mammals that are herbivores or omnivores, have these kinds of analogous or similar teeth. We've got our incisors up front, which unlike the rodents are not ever growing. All of these different teeth that we have basically record a little snapshot of our life history, depending on when it formed. Our teeth have really changed throughout our evolutionary history. When we were small apes running around in trees, we had really sharp little fangs a long time ago. As we evolved, as we had a more diverse diet, as different aspects of technological evolution came along, like cooking and fire and hunting, our teeth changed too. We then got smaller teeth because we were eating less hard objects. The actual shape of our jaws changed. It's the reason why a lot of people have to get their wisdom teeth removed. We can't actually fit all of the molars that we evolved to have in our mouth anymore. We have to get them taken out. So it's not just the chemistry of the teeth that tells us something about our life history. It's the teeth themselves that actually give us a lot of information about where our species has been and what in our environment has shaped us and potentially where we're going. Teeth are a really important archive. They tell us a lot about ourselves, about evolution, about the history of the entire planet, really. It's a pretty remarkable way to study the past and they kind of operate like small time machines that record for just a little bit of time a lot of information about ourselves that someday, maybe, a paleontologist can go and tap into. Kendra was a natural for the position of fossil director of the Beatty Biodiversity Museum. Growing up, museums helped shape who she would become. And now that she's in her new role, she wants to highlight and house the incredible fossil resources of our province, ensuring that important specimens have a home where they're cared for and available for scientific study and enjoyed by the public. I've been shaped by natural history museums my whole life. I spent a lot of time as a kid going to the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in Portland. I worked at the National Museum of Ireland. I also spent many, many years working in the National Museums of Kenya and am a research associate at the Smithsonian Institution. So museums are really core to who I am as an academic, as a scientist, and I think they play a really critical role in introducing people to science and the natural world. One of the things I'm really excited about as being here in British Columbia is working with the incredible fossil heritage of this province. I started here at the University of British Columbia in July uh, of 2021. Shortly after I started, I got to campus. I saw just across the mall from my office that there was this beautiful natural history museum and they were looking for a director of the fossil collection. Though I have done some paleontological work, I have found fossils, I work extensively with fossils, I work with a lot of paleontologists. I don't necessarily classify myself as a paleontologist, but I see the importance and the critical role that fossils play in science and natural history. Even though we have this spectacular natural history museum, the Beatty Biodiversity Museum, with its own small but very rich and mighty fossil collection. I noticed that there was sort of a lack of representation of fossils in paleontology on campus. So I, I wanted to do something, I wanted to step in, and I wanted to see paleontology grow at UBC and in Vancouver broadly. So I was asked to uh, step into the role of fossil director, which I, I did. And one of the things that I really want to see happen at the Beatty is I want to see our collection become a well-respected, kind of renowned fossil collection that is usable for scientific research and that also becomes a repository for the remarkable fossil record that is in this province. We have so many fossils in British Columbia. The fossil record here in this province 
represents 500 million years of evolution. It's absolutely spectacular, but there's not a lot of space to put those fossils. And museums are absolutely critical for this because they allow us to protect fossils and store them well into the future and to make sure that they're taken care of so that we have a permanent record of Earth's history, which is available for scientists as well as the public to see and look at and to cherish and to explore. So that's my goal for the BD. I want to see us rise to the ranks of those museums and I want to see the role that we're doing expand in terms of paleontology in British Columbia. And the BD also has an incredible collection of mammals and fish and herbaria. We have absolutely beautiful displays of natural history and the fossils are a really key part of this in terms of looking at the record of biodiversity and natural heritage from the province, but also from around the world. We do have a number of specimens from global locations. This is our goal, is to elevate paleontology in British Columbia and to provide another venue for long-term storage and protection of fossils. A lot of us encounter museums in terms of public displays. You go to a museum, you see a beautiful diorama, of animals or an ancient fossil or you might see a painting depicting somewhere in the world and it feels sort of static. It feels like you're encountering this little snapshot of life on earth. You look at what's there, you see it, you experience it, and then you leave. But what's on display, the public portion of a museum, is actually a fraction of what museums do. Much of the material that's stored in a museum, in some places, is as much as 95% of what's at that museum are in collections. And the role of collections is to protect and preserve those specimens for the future, potentially in perpetuity. So the role of museums is really important. It's not just for interaction with the public, even though it's one of the most critical roles that museums have. Really what we need is the ongoing support of natural history museums in order to make sure that they last into the future and that we're able to protect fossils and specimens and other things that are important well into the future. A few years ago, a natural history museum in Brazil burned to the ground and it was a tragedy. Not only did we lose fossils, but we lost herbarium specimens we can never get back. We lost recordings of indigenous languages that we can't get back. We don't have a record of those languages anymore. We've lost artifacts, just countless objects we can't ever find again. So these records of Earth's diversity and Earth's past and, and the kind of cultural diversity of the planet are gone. The best funded museums in the world are sort of protected against those kinds of things. They have buildings and they have protections and they have fireproofing and those sorts of things. But a lot of the heritage of the world that we care about is in museums that don't have that same level of protection. The kind of purpose of protecting all of this heritage is a global effort. And the BD is participating in one small way as a beautiful modern museum and a collection space to help save and preserve and keep a record of these things. But really, it matters that all of us care about museums and all of us want to support them because once those artifacts are gone, they're gone forever. Dr. Kritz's career has spanned the gamut as a paleontologist. She's worked with fossil mammals and our human history, helping to define the Anthropocene, the most recent period in our Earth's history where human activity, our activity, has had a significant impact on the planet's climate and ecosystems. Her lens for the future includes our human impact and the ongoing study of our world, preserving, protecting, and learning from the many creatures we share it with.